Okay, here is a little bit of the origin and history of sociology. The development of sociology in the United States. <clears throat> sociology had its roots in Europe and did not become widely recognized in the United States until almost the beginning of the 20th century. The early growth of American sociology began at the University of Chicago. That setting provided a context in which a large number of scholars and their students could work closely to refine their views of the discipline. It was there that the first graduate department of sociology in the United States was founded in the 1890s. From the 1920s to the 1940s, the so-called Chicago School of Sociologists led American sociology in the study of communities with particular emphasis on urban neighborhoods and ethnic areas. And now they really figured out how to make money with it, aren't they? And power. Many of America's leading sociologists from this period were members of the Chicago School, including Robert E. Park, W. I. Thomas, and Ernest W. Burgess. Most of these individuals were Protestant ministers or sons of ministers, and as a group, they were deeply concerned with social reform. I need to read some more of that history. Also in Chicago, but not directly part of the university, Jane Addams, 1860-1935, was also deeply committed to social reform. Jane Addams was born in 1860 to a pro prosperous Quaker family dedicated to the anti-slavery cause. Her father, John Adams, was a politician and friend of Abraham Lincoln. Jane Adams was part of the first generation of middle-class women to go to college and graduated as valedictorian from Rockford Female Seminary, Illinois, in 1881. <clears throat> Few professions were open to educated women then, and after graduation, Adams returned home and was expected to wait for a marriage proposal. During the next few years, Adams traveled through Europe and observed the poverty that existed in the city's slums. She also studied ways in which various organizations attempted to alleviate poverty. poverty. During her stay in London, she visited a settlement house run by Oxford University students where they helped the poor. She used this settlement house called Toynbee Hall as a model for a program she would later develop in Chicago to assist the poor. Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr finally opened the door to their own version of Toynbee Hall, Hull House, Hull. In September 1889, it was designed to serve the immigrant population of Chicago's 19th Ward. For 40 years, Hull House successfully served the community by offering a wide variety of clubs and activities. During this time, Hull House and Jane Addams became known internationally for championing the rights of immigrants <clears throat> and fighting for child labor laws. She also advocated for industrial safety, juvenile courts, labor unions, women's suffrage, and world peace. And really, I've read history on <clears throat> the child labor laws back then. Families had to use their kids to even to survive. And these big business men and farmers, as well as industrial, used kids for slave wages. And that's pretty much what they use the Hispanics for nowadays too. Anyway, and they use the tool that they bring with them by making it illegal. You know what I'm talking about. Adams wrote extensively <clears throat> about Hull House activities. She published 11 books and numerous articles, and she spoke often at venues throughout the United States and the world. She lived on her inheritance and the proceeds from her writing and speaking engagements because she did not receive a salary from Hull House. She also used her income to underwrite various social causes throughout her life. 
In 1907, she published Newer Ideals of Peace, for which she became known internationally as a pacifist. This brought her much ridicule when the United States entered World War I. But in time, the public began to embrace her ideals. By 1931, her reputation as a peacemaker was firmly established, and she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, shared with Nicholas Murray Butler. After that, people from all over the world began to write her letters and to extol her work. She received pleas for intervention around the world to help alleviate hunger, poverty, and oppression. Swarthmore College W.E.B. Du Bois 1868 to 1963, became the first African American to receive a Ph.D. from Harvard in 1896 with his dissertation, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States. Du Bois then went on to Atlanta, Atlanta University, where he established and was in charge of the sociology program until 1910, when he left to become editor of the Crises the Journal of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. By that time, Du Bois had written dozens of articles and books on the history and sociology of African Americans and was the country's leading African American sociologist. When Du Bois came of age, racism was very much a part of the American landscape <clears throat> on both a popular and academic level. Politicians and writers were openly declaring that blacks belonged to an inferior race and contributed nothing to society. Du Bois believed that doctrines and theories had a powerful effect on social conditions. Slavery and the disenfranchisement of blacks were rooted in the notion of the inferiority of the race. It was important, he felt, to change these beliefs to improve the status of African Americans. Much of his scholarly work was governed by his view the sociological studies of African Americans would have a positive effect on public opinion. Du Bois argued for the acceptance of African Americans into all areas of society and advocated militant resistance to white racism. <clears throat> he believed that it was not solely the responsibilities of blacks, nor was it in their capacity to alter their collective place in American society but that it was primarily the responsibility of whites who held the power to effect such change. Yes, and there's still a lot of them guilty for this. And they go about it more secretly now. In 1903, he published The Souls of Black Folk, a collection of excellent, well-reasoned essays on race relations. Blending sociology and economics, he described the injustices that had scarred the black experience in the United States. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, he declared. Throughout his life, Du Bois considered himself torn between being a black man and being an American. This conflict led him to feel like an exile in the United States, and eventually he left and moved to Ghana. As Du Bois noted in his autobiography, had it not been for the race problem early thrust upon me and enveloping me, I should have probably been an unquestioning worshiper at the shrine of the established social order into which I was born. But just that part of this order which seemed to most of my fellows nearest perfection seemed to me most inequitable and wrong, and started from that critique, I gradually, as the years went by, found other things to question in my environment. Du Bois, 1968 Du Bois died in 1963 at the age of 95, one day before the famous March on Washington took place where Martin Luther King Jr. made his I Have a Dream speech. It was ironic that the American's preeminent black intellectual died on the eve of this great civil rights gathering which had gained so much energy from his ideas against segregation. Du Bois had long, long ago concluded that the possibility of racial equality was a receding mirage for people of color. At the time of his death, he was leading the life of a political exile in Ghana. Talcott Parsons, 1902-1979, was the sociologist most responsible for developing theories of structural functionalism in the United States. He presided over the Department of Social Relations at Harvard College from the 1930s 
until he retired in 1973. Parsons' early research was quite empirical, but he later returned to the phil philosophical and theoretical side of sociology and the structure of social action. <clears throat> 1937, Parsons presented English translations of the writings of European thinkers, most notably Weber and Durkheim. In his best-known work, The Social System, 1951, Parsons portrayed society as a stable system of well-ordered, interrelated parts. His viewpoint elaborated on Durkheim's perspective. Robert K. Merton also had been an influential proponent of functionalist theory in his classic work, Social Theory and Social Structure, 1968, first published in 1949. Merton spelled out the functionalist view of society. One of his main contributions to sociology was to distinguish between two forms of social functions, manifest functions and latent functions. By social functions, Merton meant those social processes that contribute to the ongoing operation or maintenance of society. Manifest and functions are the intended and recognized consequences of these processes. For example, one of the manifest functions of going to college is to obtain knowledge, training, and a degree in a specific area. Latent functions are the unintended or not readily recognized consequences of such processes, which I think is probably why bad people are using sociology for their lies and stuff to get elected through political science, people working for them to give them the idea, or uh, or there's a, a the churches whose products are people. Therefore, college can also offer the opportunity of establishing lasting friendships and finding potential marriage partners. Under the leadership of Parsons and Merton, sociology in the United States moved away from a concern with social reform and adopted a so-called value-free perspective. This perspective, which Max Weber advocated, requires description and explanation rather than prescription. It holds that people should be told what is, not what should be. And that just does appear to be what sociology is about now. It's for a bad thing just to control people, and that is so wrong. Even a religion acting in that capacity has raised above the one true living God and is committing blasphemy for money. Now we'll see what will happen in that. I have a couple other things in here that I found interesting. Um... <clears throat> Uh, in here about religion, like an emotion, one of the functions of ritual and prayer is to produce an appropriate emotional state. This can be done in many ways. In some religions, participants in ritual deliberately attempt to alter their states of consciousness through the use of drugs, fasting, sleep deprivation, and induction of physical pain. Thus, Scandinavian groups ate mushrooms that caused euphoria, as did many native Siberian tribes. Various Native American religions use pe peyote, a button-like mushroom that contains a hallucinogenic drug. There are approximately 250,000 members of the Native American church who believe that the use of peyote brings them closer to God. Even though it is illegal to use peyote in most states, Congress made it possible for federally recognized tribes to practice traditional Indian ceremonies, even if it violates local laws. And this is so true. These drugs do bring you closer to God, as they have me. And you finding people that's against legalizing drugs, they are working for Satan, because they hate God. And the gifts he gave, gave us, like the herb marijuana. It was one of the meat that was spoken of in Genesis. Although not every religion tries to induce altered states of consciousness, and believers all religions do recognize that such states may happen and believe that they can be the result of divine 
<clears throat> or sacred intervention in human affairs. Prophets, of course, are thought to receive divine inspiration. Religions differ in the degree of importance they attach to such happenings. And I have to wonder, would it be punishment for the way that some of these people are, are being mean and hurtful to other people by jumping in their personal businesses and things and find a closeness to God through punishment? Because that would be one way to get closer to Him. And we shall see. Uh, I have one or two more things in here to talk about and I'll be right back.